Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to CREATE. Uh, we're going to start our session, App Meets Security. I am uh, Christian Veer. I'm a dev evangelist here at uh, DevNet, um, and I focus on security. And we have some amazing talks here, but I want to remind everyone that uh, developers.cisco.com has amazing content, and we are developing a lot of content on security. So it's a great place to go learn. Uh, I know security has a little bit of inertia, where people think that, hey, um, I don't know anything about it. Um, I'm not probably very good in learning new things. Or there is an inertia or a hesitance against uh, developing on security. So we are making that easy. We want you to overcome that inertia. Security is very easy to understand. And Russ here, who is our first speaker, he is part of the SNORT team. And uh, um, uh, he was part of Sourcefire, which got acquired by Cisco. So now it's part of Cisco. And he's, he's going to today talk about the new version of Snort. And, uh, um, and he's, he's, he's one of the uh, good, great engineer I know. So welcome, Russ. So go ahead. Thanks. Well, thank you. So I'm going to talk about Snort++, which is the next generation of Snort, uh, the next version, 3.0. Uh, we'll look at the overview and the underbelly, and by that I mean we'll look at the high-level goals and the high-level design, as well as some of the details of configuring Snort++ and using Snort++ rules. Has anybody here actually used Snort? Okay, that's cool. That's awesome. Has anybody used Snort++? Uh, not surprising. Hopefully, I can change your minds about that and get you to start playing with that. This is my evil doppelganger. Uh, he's been working on Snort for quite a while and working on Snort++ for the past three years, uh, give or take. So before we dive into the overview and the underbelly, let's start with a brief history of Snort to put things in perspective. Uh, Snort started out almost two decades ago, which is like ancient. Uh, it started out as a packet sniffer. Uh, with the addition of rules or signatures, it became an IDS, an intrusion detection system, so it could alert on the contents of those packets. Uh, eventually, the rules supported a drop verdict so that you could place it in line and block uh, flows that were deemed to be evil. And uh, there's some important things to note about the origins of Snort. Uh, it, since it started out as a packet sniffer, it has provisional statefulness. Everything in Snort is a packet, and sometimes it's looking at wire packets, and sometimes it's looking at rebuilt PDUs, which have to be packets. Um, it predates commodity multi-core systems, and that means it doesn't scale particularly well, because you have to have multiple Snort processes running, and that means multiple configurations, et cetera, loaded into memory. Uh, so Marty Resch, the creator of Snort, back in about 2007, he created something called Snort SP, which is the Snort security platform. It was a framework, and I spent a good amount of time porting the version of Snort that we had at the time into this framework and then working on performance issues. And it was determined that uh, you know, we could bring the performance up to roughly on par with Snort, uh, but um, we couldn't make it go any further with what we had at the time, and then other priorities took over. There were some cool things that came out of that. That's where the DAC came from. If you know Snort, it has this thing called the DAC Data Acquisition Interface. That's how it gets packets. It allows you to have different, uh, you know, one build that can get packets from PCAPs or AF packet or whatever without changing it. Um, and some performance tuning and so on. It also had Lua. But we had to continue on with the development of Snort. We took some of that stuff and put it in Snort. And then we uh, built out the IPS mode, which means that we could normalize packets, we could normalize streams and we could detect attacks sooner. Uh, we support an NGFW, so it can have things like application identification rules and so on. Uh, and then, of course, the file processing, so we can locate a file, uh, determine what the type is, calculate the signature, and then uh, actually capture the, the file if we want. So uh, roughly in 2013, I got another opportunity to work on the next generation of Snort, and that's when Snort++ uh, actually began. So uh, what is the plus plus thing all about? Well, it represents an increment of the base version, the major version, from 2.0 or 2.x to 3.0. Uh, it means that we're using C++, and it means that we're doing an incremental 
uh, iterative development to build it out. And um, it's the walking skeleton concept. Uh, we're working uh, smarter, not harder. You'll see that throughout the slides that come up. The overall goals are to improve both detection and uh, throughput at the same time. We also want to improve scalability and extensibility and a bunch of other things. And, and you'll see that as we go through. So starting with scalability, with Snort 2x, vanilla Snort, there is one packet thread and multiple control threads. With Snort++, we've turned that around. We have multiple packet threads and one control thread. And the significance of that is that all of the packet threads share the configuration. They share the fast pattern search engines. They share the network map, um, which is where we compile all the, the things we're learning about the network as we're processing. Uh, and that means that it scales better because it doesn't take as much memory, and there's more memory to use for state. Um, there's other follow-on effects. For example, if you have a 24-core system, you have, to, you have to run 24 vanilla snorts. And that means if you want to change your config and reload it, you have to reload it 24 times. With Snort++, you just reload the one config, so it's just one time, which obviously can be done qu more quickly. Uh, this diagram depicts the high-level design of Snort++. Uh, it's somewhat simplified, but roughly speaking, in the left, in yellow, there is a uh, well-worn path for the normal processing that we do with packets, things that we might do with every packet, like decode uh, the packet or defragment, desegment, um, all these things you see on the left. On the right, there's a pub-sub mechanism. And so we can have good performance on the left, and we can have good flexibility on the right. And the significance of this is that there's a lot of plugins in Snort++, and we want to be able to support you know, arbitrary collaboration. We don't know in advance what all of the threats will, how they will manifest, and so we can't pre-program a path you know, with all, the, all, with all the conditions to get to the point where we do specific processing. But what we can do is support that collaboration by allowing inspectors or whatever to generate inspection events and then having other plugins consume those. And the framework mediates or facilitates that communication, but it doesn't care what the, what the events are. And that allows us to add uh, considerable functionality in a very flexible way. Uh, another thing about that is that uh, we have what are called JIT buffer stuffers. This means that the, uh, the time didn't start. How much time do I have? Does anybody know? Oh, great. i got to move a lot faster. So uh, JIT buffer stuffers, that means that when we publish information, we publish access to it. We don't actually push the data. If someone wants a normalized buffer, they can ask for it, and the normalization will be done on demand. So we do it just in time instead of just in case. Uh, moving along, there's a plugin framework. So there's several types of plugins. Um, the codec for encoding and decoding packets, inspectors for things like HTTP, uh, the fast pattern search engine, and so on. Uh, the, the plugins have a very specific purpose. And to implement one, you, 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 you define an API struct that, that allows uh, the framework to instantiate a subclass of the base class for that uh, particular plugin. And you build out a mo you, you define a module which has things that glue it to the framework, like it defines the parameters, it defines peg counts, uh, provides access to performance metrics, and so on. Um, moving beyond packets, uh, Snort everything in vanilla Snort is a packet. If you rebuild an HTTP PDU, you carve it out of a stream. You've got to package that in an actual packet. It has all the layers, uh, the encapsulations. In Snort plus plus, we don't have to do that. A packet is basically an abstraction, a unit of work, and we can attach to that a wire packet, or we can attach to that an arbitrary buffer, and we can process that. Um, that allows us to do other types of things. For example, we can process files. Uh, instead of PCAPs, you, we can give it a PDF, and it will uh, you know, identify the file type and calculate a signature. Or you can connect two sockets. It'll, it'll bridge together two sockets, and you can process the payload. So there's all kinds of things we can do with that uh, flexibility. And um, I should highlight that there is a new and improved HTTP inspector. The uh, old one was uh, a source of pain for a very long time. Um, and it's fully stateful. So moving on to the underbelly. Uh, we'll start with the configuration. The configuration uses LuaJIT. 
this means that we have a consistent syntax and also we have a script that is executed when you load it. So the configuration isn't just some static thing that says what it is, it's actually a live thing that executes and can calculate values and so on, as this example shows. Um, Snort has some other uh, uh, goodies that go along with that. For example, it can output all semantic errors before it fails. Um, any configuration setting can be overridden on the command line. You can say dash dash lua whatever and set something. So you can run your conf one way and then change the config by adding or changing a command line option and run it again. Um, I'll get into the wizard next. There, since this is obviously not backwards compatible, there is a utility, we call it snort to lua, and it will convert your 2.x conf into the 3.0 format. Here's an example. Uh, this is the vanilla snort 2.x on the left in yellow and snort plus plus in the green on the right. Um, some things you may notice uh, in, in snort, um, you see that the first thing, the stream 5 global, is actually comma separated options. And then you see that the HTTP inspect server is just space separated. You see that stream 5 TCP has a port list. There's only one port there, but it's a list. And it doesn't use curly braces, but HTTP does. So the syntax is all over the place. Um, that's all cleaned up because it's just Lua. Uh, and so this syntax on the right, I the, if you see stream TCP, uh, for example, is saying instantiate the stream TCP module. And the open and close braces mean just use the built-in defaults. I don't want to change anything. Uh, the wizard is saying use default wizard. That's coming from snortdefaults.lua. So simple scalar things like ints, enum, strings, whatever, are baked in. Things that are based on lists of tables and whatnot, like the wizard is, are uh, configured externally. And it makes it easy for you to copy and paste that and change it however you want. Um, and this at the bottom is showing a command line case where we're, where we're actually setting, uh, because we instantiate HTTP inspect, we can set HTTP inspect .decompress PDF uh, on the command line. Text rules. Um, the text rules, there's a long history with the text rules. We did not want to change that and lose that history. But in order to move forward, we had to make some concessions. We wanted a uniform syntax, for example. We also wanted to make all of the rule options plugins. So uh, we, uh, we, it is not backwards compatible, but again, Snort to Lua will convert your rules. If you understand Snort rules, you will understand Snort++ rules. They look very much the same, except they're a little bit simpler. I'll get into some of these details on the next slide, which has an example. Um, who tells, can someone tell me how much time I have? Oh, now it's working. Go, cool, I can see that. So uh, there is... Uh, on top, we have a vanilla snort rule, and we have the same snort rule for snort++ plus plus on the bottom. You can see that in green, um, we formatted it nicely because it doesn't have to be on one line. It, we can have arbitrary white space. We don't need the, the, the new line escapes uh, if we want to do that for 2x. You can see that there's a uh, C-style comment embedded in the rule. Um, we can also have the pound comments or pound begin, pound end, and, and, and remarks and so on. Uh, beyond the superficial stuff, the rule header says alert HTTP. Um, that is vastly simpler than what you have with the 2x rule. Uh, in this case, for the 2x rule, what really matters is HTTP ports. But here, we don't have to uh, explicitly say what all the ports are because we don't always know. Um, we can put in the, the ports if, we, if it's significant, but if we just want to get HTTP, we say, okay, alert on HTTP. Looking at the rule body, HTTP URI is only there one time. Uh, Talos calls that feature a sticky buffer. Basically, we identify the buffer up front and use it until we change it later in the rule. In this case, there's just the one buffer in play. In the rule on top, there's actually HTTP URI four times, uh, one for each content, and then that capital U that's highlighted there in bold uh, for the PCRE. So, um, and also we don't have the, uh, the metadata service because that's implied by the alert HTTP. So the rule is simpler. We can actually go one better than that. And if we use Intel's hyperscan library, uh, there is a plugin that does the fast pattern detection using the hyperscan library. There's also a plugin that provides a regex rule option that you see here. And for this particular rule, all the contents in the PCRE were um, applied to the HTTP URI. And in this particular case, uh, we can make a regex. It's very much like PCRE, but not quite as, not quite as capable. Um, but it's very high performance. And we can identify exactly what we want with that regex that's designated as a fast pattern. 
That means that if this rule, that if this fast pattern matches, there's virtually nothing to do. So this is a very high performance solution. Um, and we can, we're actually going to take it a step further and, and get rid of this flow as established uh, stuff there. So there will be nothing to do in this case. If the fast pattern hits, it's a match. All right, SO rules. Has anyone written or read an SO rule from Vanilla Snort? Uh, if you've ever seen one, um, you'll know what I'm talking about. They're pretty gnarly. Uh, in order to implement it, you have to write it in C structs. So it's a nested set of C structs that spell out all the options. There's all kinds of flags or together, and there's zeros and nulls all over the place, and who knows what it means. It's, it's, it's really hard to, to write one of those things. In Snort++, it's just the text rule. You can modify it in certain ways, and then you compile that in to make a header. You include that in your code, and away you go. So it's substantially simpler. SO rules, by the way, I'm, I'm moving quickly here. SO rules are used to uh, do things that you can't quite do with the existing rule syntax. Of course, with an SO rule, you can also define uh, your own uh, uh, rule options and extend the language. This is an example. You see some of the, the C structs there. That's by no means a complete rule. It's just the tip of the iceberg. On the right, you have the rule. Um, it's, it's got an uh, SOID that's used to define the stub. It's got this SO eval at the bottom. That means that I want to run this function called eval when I get to that point in the rule. And of course, you could have more of those. You could put them wherever you want, uh, and so on. So you can see that this is substantially simpler to uh, implement. OK, so there's just about a minute left. Um, this is by no means all there is to Snort++. I really only had time to touch on a few key things. Uh, on the left here in green, you can see there's a whole bunch of other stuff that it already does um, that's new and improved. Uh, on the right, you can see there are things that are coming up. Um, one of the things that it does now, it has a command line shell. So you can connect, say, via Telnet at, or a Unix socket. You can uh, uh, issue a command, say, to, to reload the config or to pause and resume the processing. Um, one of the things that's coming up is incremental reload. You'll be able to just reload a specific inspector, for example, instead of reloading the whole config. Uh, so you'll be able to do um, uh, more specific targeted things and have a more fluid uh, update. Finally, uh, if you're not already using Snort++, I uh, urge you to check it out. You can get it from Git. Uh, the master branch is always a valid uh, point. You can build from that and test it. Um, we're also on snort.org slash snort3, and there's blogs and emails, uh, email lists you can subscribe to. And that's it. So any questions, uh, please raise your hand. And yeah. Russ? I was just curious, you mentioned uh, anomaly detection and the upcoming one. It, will that be like an API call to some sort of machine learning, or is there some just simple way that you define an anomaly? Uh, we've actually got a few things in the works. Uh, it's based on the uh, pub sub events. And so a lot of it would be based on, for example, when a flow starts or when a flow ends, information is published and then consumed by stuff that's trying to do anomaly detection. Any other questions? Uh, how are the differences with respect to Sri Kata? I'm sorry? Differences with respect to Sri Kata? That's another IDS? Sri Kata? Yeah. Yeah, Sri Kata is pretty cool. Um, I don't have time to get into all the details, but uh, Sri Kata uh, basically was a clone of Snort back in around 2007, 2008 when we did Snort SP. They cloned the Snort code base and they uh, added multiple packet threads. Um, so they moved ahead in, in that regard. Uh, but uh, our performance is pretty good, and uh, we'll definitely be competitive with that. And I think we're, you know, th they have a C solution. Um, I think our extensibility is, uh, is, is vastly superior to that. Yeah, I didn't put up a slide on performance because uh, I don't want to be held to that. But uh, so far. Um, we can do substantially better, uh, roughly double, 
uh, but again, don't hold me to that because these aren't official numbers yet. We don't have a beta out. But uh, that's just with the, the improved design, um, you know, not requiring packets and the working smarter, not harder part. Uh, if you throw in hyperscan, um, the performance improves again by another factor of two or so. Uh, that's roughly what we're seeing. But uh, you know, again, we don't have the final uh, version out there. We'll, we'll never have that. But, but the numbers are good. Yeah. So uh, since Snort uh, sees the traffic, can we use Snort for telemetry too? So for, for what? I'm sorry? For telemetry? For so telemetry? Tel yeah, telemetry. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I mean, we have uh, a new um, performance monitor, all of the modules. From you know plugins provide the modules and modules provide things like peg counts. Um, we actually are using we actually have a uh, a version that has uh, f that uses flat buffers to publish that stuff, and uh, there's a very easy way to get at configure whatever the data is that you want, and Snort will write that out and and you can use it to do. So we're also adding probes so that you'll be able to uh, on the fly say I want to attach this to f to certain flows or I want to do this in general and have those write out um, uh, particular data that you want. And uh, we have Lua JIT right now for uh, rule options and for loggers, but we're also going to add that for the, for the uh, inspectors, particularly for probes. So hopefully there's a way to get at what you're looking for. Thank you. Uh, if you guys have any more follow-up questions, Russ is going to be here for some time. So if you want, you can follow up with Russ. Um, so our next uh, session, which we're going to start, is uh, is from Rohit. And he's going to touch a little bit on um, Contiv. Uh, and his presentation will be focused on how you can push policies to secure your application inside the container. So it is going to be an interesting talk. So Rohit, Great. Floor is Thank you so much. Um, Right, so my name is uh, Rohit Agarwala. I'm a senior technical lead in the, in the cloud platform and services group at Cisco. Um, so the topic here today that I'm going to cover is networking and policy for your containerized applications, dev test to production. Um, before we get into you know, how Contiv, uh, or what is Contiv, and what is Contiv providing uh, specifically to this topic, um, just want to get a quick show of hands of how many people have played with containers or know something about containers. All right, excellent. Uh, I think about more than 50% of the audience here is familiar with containers. So containers, again, is, a, is the new trend of you know, decomposing your mo monolithic application into microservices uh, where basically your container has all the dependencies and the packages. And there are, of course, other benefits of leveraging the host operating system to bring up a quick, small component of your entire application architecture, uh, and then enabling that all that deployment through a platform uh, that, you know, in a way, keeps track of how many number of instances you want that to be deployed. So there are container platforms that do that job for you. Um, so containers have become, you know, kind of the new way or the new lifecycle management for uh, modern applications. Uh, but from a networking and policy point of view, they bring along new challenges. Um, if you think from a networking perspective, um, you know, previously we just had like bare metal servers that were connected to switches and you basically provisioned them on a single VLAN, um, you know, by an ops team or something and, and it all worked. You know, then came the wave of, you know, virtualization with VMware and in OpenStack uh, where you could easily spin up, you know, X number of virtual machines on multiple hosts. And then, you know, we got the hypervisor switch come in, you know, open v switch, Linux bridge, all of these, you know, the s switching layer was starting to get pushed further into the host. Um, and VMs provided you with that, uh, you know, the VM networking was provided by that layer on the host. But now, microservices and containers are the new way of developing applications. And these containers can basically be deployed within virtual machines or can also be deployed directly on bare metal servers. So from a networking perspective, now you have a new set of challenges that you need to think of that as you spin up these containers 
within virtual machines or within bare metal servers, how do you connect them with each other? That's the first part. Uh, the second part is, well, not everything is going to move to containers tomorrow, right? I mean, every technology adoption curve, I mean, if you look at it, it, it takes a while before it becomes mainstream. So there will be still parts of your application, like your database may be running on a bare metal server. But you still need to be able to connect from your containers to that bare metal server in some shape or form. And you need all of this to be automatically provisioned so that your developers that are focusing on spinning up these containers, their workflow, trying to develop the business logic for their application, they don't get affected. Under the hood, everything should just work right out of the box for them. So that's kind of the first set of problems that we try and solve. Like, how do I achieve networking in a multi-tenant environment where I'm providing isolation and providing the tenancy in a container deployment? The second problem that, that we, we will address here is uh, you know, the security and the policy aspect. Uh, so once you have deployed these containers in, in your environment, you want to control the connectivity. There is one aspect that you can keep them in a same segment, which could be any sort of uh, you know, networking backend that enables to them to be in the same segment. But you still want to define at some level of uh, you know, granularity in terms of controlling the ports that are getting exposed out of your container. Uh, you want to be able to define you know, egress and ingress rules in terms of traffic that's coming inside your container. Right? Uh, we have been seeing those kind of functionality being implemented on the host through using NAT tables. We have seen that implemented on our switches and routers uh, on, uh, you know, through ACLs. Uh, so there has to be some mechanism that ties this policy grouping construct of identifying what containers can talk to each other and what are the application ports that need to be exposed to not, not just other containers in your deployment, but to other infrastructure pieces as well that capability needs to be built in. So these are kind of the two problems that, that we are trying to solve here. First, again, in summary, is the networking aspect. Second is once we are able to connect these containers, how do I provide security and policy enforcement on these multiple endpoints that are coming up within VM as well as on bare metal server? So with that problem statement in mind, um, now let me introduce you to Contiv, what it is, and how it is basically helping you solve the two problems that I just talked about. Uh, so Contiv is a Cisco-sponsored 100% open source project. Um, everything that we are doing in Contiv is available under Apache v2 license. It's part of an open source community. Uh, and it's built on two main things, uh, which is kind of captured at the bottom of the slide. Uh, the first thing is that it is the most powerful container networking fabric. And the, the reason that I say that is because it provides you as a developer or even as an ops team to configure multiple networking backends for your container deployment. Uh, so whether you are using VLANs in an L2 mode uh, with Contiv, or you're using overlays, if VXLAN is your choice, or you know, popular uh, mechanisms such as L3 BGP, which is, which is starting to become popular with, with container deployments, you could enable that as well. Uh, or integration with Cisco infrastructure like ACI, uh, you could enable that as well. Uh, keep in mind, this, these are all four different options that are available as part of the same entire Contiv framework. And you as a developer have a flexibility to basically uh, work with your ops team to define what backend is, is, is going to work within your organization. So that's, that's the first part that we, we, we provide all of these options built into the fabric itself. Uh, the second point here is the rich policy model. So this goes to the second problem that we are trying to solve, which is that we have an a inbuilt policy model within Contiv itself. So once you have the container connectivity, you can define groups and endpoints and policies and rules. Uh, these are objects that are available through APIs uh, as part of the Contiv solution. Uh, and your developers can basically define these and associate them with the containers or pods when they are getting deployed. Uh, I, in fact, have a live demo, and we'll see how we are, in fact, associating pods in a Kubernetes environment when they are getting deployed uh, to different networks and being applied uh, different groups. So, so again, uh, networking, policy, uh, that's all captured with Contiv. Uh, any networking, any infrastructure, so we know uh, from a deployment perspective 
that containers can be deployed on bare metal servers or on virtual machines, whether theirs are on VMware or an OpenStack cluster or even on a public cloud such as AWS or Azure or Google Cloud. So we make sure that Contiv as a networking and a policy uh, Lego block for your container environments, irrespective of any of these infrastructure deployment models, uh, we, we enable you to, uh, uh, or you can deploy and work in those environments. Uh, any platform, um, again, you know, uh, with the advent of multiple container platforms such as Docker Swarm and Kubernetes and Mesosphere and Pivotal Cloud Foundry, uh, there are multiple of these platforms, uh, and we have provided integration uh, through the networking model of, of all of these different platforms uh, for Contiv as well. So in case if you're deploying Docker Swarm, uh, you know, Docker Swarm has a container networking model uh, as the driver model to integrate with different drivers. So we have a Contiv CNM driver within Docker. Uh, if you're using Kubernetes, uh, they follow the container networking interface model, which also became the 10th project within the uh, CNCF foundation just uh, earlier this week. So we have the Contiv CNI driver as well to enable you to connectivity for your pods that are getting deployed within a Kubernetes environment. Uh, similarly, OpenShift, uh, that is the uh, enterprise, or th that is the Red Hat's uh, uh, platform uh, that is with extensions on top of Kubernetes. So we again have the Contiv integration with an OpenShift platform as well. Um, so just to summarize in terms of the roles that, that you see in the slide, the DevOps role and the IT admin role. So these are kind of the two primary roles that, that we kind of see with the new uh, trend of microservices and how these two roles work together. Your IT admin is basically caring about, hey, I, I'm going to give you a container platform. Here's the physical infrastructure. Here's the networking fabric. You know, go deploy your applications. And so it's important to make sure that the, the container networking and the policy block is integrating with IT components that your IT administrator cares about. So within Contiv, for example, we provide integration with ACI because ACI has other advantages from a networking perspective and a policy perspective. That's one advantage. Then from an RBAC L uh, and LDAP perspective, we want to make sure that if you have an Active Directory installation uh, within your data center, we want to provide the authentication and authorization for different roles that are consuming and defining these policies within your container environment. Uh, and thirdly, uh, integration with VMs as well as with bare metal servers. So your container traffic that needs to communicate with these other components within your data center, that's what your network admin or the IT admin cares about. So we make sure that we provide those semantics or we provide those capabilities in Contiv to enable that seamless connectivity across different uh, uh, resources that are connected in your data center to the networking fabric. From a DevOps perspective, all you care about is, hey, I'm going to define my application uh, profile. I'm going to define my YAML file that consists of uh, the images that I'm going to download from a Kubernetes point of view, for example, or I'm going to define the networks, uh, as well as the policies that are going to be applied to these networks. And there you go. That's it. So you will see in that in the demo that uh, from an application or a DevOps perspective, your workflow does not change, but you're consuming these application policies that are being defined uh, by your IT administrator, and you can basically just use them in your application directly. So we announced uh, just at DockerCon, you know, uh, that was about, I think, last month, uh, Contiv 1.0. Uh, again, this is uh, generally available as an upstream open source project. Uh, when I say 1.0, it's a 1.0 open source version that's available. Uh, these are some of the features, you know, new features that have been introduced in 1.0. Um, Important to keep in mind here is the integration and the support that we are providing, both from a community perspective as well as uh, from a Cisco perspective, because we are going to be able to support the customers that pick our open source uh, code and deploy that in production, so Cisco can stand behind and even support that model. Uh, but we do have an active uh, Slack community. We have a GitHub where, uh, page where all of our code is there. Um, and we support against all of the open source pl uh, container platforms such as Kubernetes and Docker Swarm, as well as with the supported platforms such as OpenShift that I talked about. Um, since the focus here is more about security and policy, so I thought it would be useful to give you know, uh, a rundown of what the policy model looks like, and then we'll switch into our demo to see how, how, how we are basically making use of this policy model. Um, so here what you can see is as a tenant or as an end user, I basically have these five resources that I care about. Uh, containers or pods is what I'm going to spin up. 
which basically will capture all of my application dependencies, what images, and everything that I'm using. But in addition to that, uh, context gives you the capabilities to define the other four constructs. So you will start by creating a network as a, as a developer that, hey, I want to be able to spin my containers on the following network. Uh, and the network has properties like the following subnet. It needs to use a gateway. So this is where you will communicate with your DevOps or with your IT admin team to figure out what are those parameters that you need to use. Uh, of course, if you're using something like a VXNA, VXLAN, excuse me, VXLAN tunnel, uh, for your application connectivity, you can pretty much define RFC 1918 IP addresses, uh, and, and you can go, go ahead. But if you're trying to integrate with rest of the data center components, then you want to work with your IT admin. Uh, so once you have defined your network, you will be spinning up basically uh, containers on that network. And, and that will all uh, come well, because now once you connect containers on those networks by using the labels in your policy def in your YAML file, uh, you will be able to connect them onto the net network that has been defined in Contiv. Uh, but if you want to provide the policies as well as the uh, control over the ports that are being exposed, not just within containers, but to the rest of the other components, then you want to start grouping them into something called endpoint groups. So in Contiv, you can basically create these groups, such as my app group and my DB group, and then associate these labels when you're spinning up the containers. So what that would do is that when the containers come up, they will be associated with the app and the DB endpoint group labels. Uh, once you have these groups and, and, and kind of categorized your containers or pods into these groups, you can now apply the policies uh, with rules within those policies to those endpoint groups. So this is kind of how a developer would go about uh, you know, providing the connectivity and the, then defining the constructs of endpoint groups and the policies and the rules that get attached to the network that they have defined. Um, does that make sense? Any questions before I switch into the demo? OK. Let's go into the demo here. Uh, let me get out of my PowerPoint. OK. This is a Kubernetes. I'm gonna be, I have a Kubernetes cluster set up. Uh, and uh, I've got Contiv as my CNI driver enabled. I'm going to run through a script. Uh, and it has got a bunch of commands. And I'm going to basically walk you through what, what those commands are going to be doing. So the first command here is basically running you know, what are the different nodes that are deployed in my cluster. So I've got three nodes uh, that are running. So one is a master node, two are worker nodes. So when I spin up my pods, they're going to come up on my, on my worker nodes. Um, this is now I'm getting into the contest part. Uh, I've basically set up using my netcuttle utility. Netcuttle is a Contiv CLI utility that we provide that's a client that basically talks with our Contiv master. I'm setting a bunch of parameters here. Uh, important to note here is I'm setting up routing, which is for my VXLAN fabric, and I'm defining the VXLAN range as well. So these are important global parameters that you set before you start actually uh, configuring Contiv overall. Uh, because this remains consistent across your entire of deployment. Uh, the next thing that I'm doing, like I had mentioned before, I'm creating a network here. So using my, again, netcuttle netcreate command, I'm defining within the default tenant that I'm going to be using an encapsulation type of VXLAN. I'm defining a subnet, I'm defining a gateway, and I'm telling what network, uh, uh, I'm giving the network name here. Um, and that's what in the next command, I basically did a net ls, using context command to list down the two networks that I have. Uh, you will notice here there are two networks. First is an infra network. This is a private internal network that we have within Contiv uh, to actually enable the host on which my pods are coming up to communicate with the containers themselves. Uh, this is required for the Kubernetes health check requirement. Uh, but the network on which our containers are going to be coming up is the data network, which is the new net network that I have defined here. We're going to continue here. This is, this is the part. Uh, where I'm now starting to basically create those endpoint groups uh, and define basically the policies within those groups. So I've created um, a, a policy called app to db I've created two groups, app and DB group, and I've created three policies within the app to db policy, uh, that is to say deny TCMP, UDP, and ICMP traffic. Um, we'll continue here. Now I've just spun up three pods. Uh, this is where the developer is basically specifying constructs that they have defined uh, using the uh, contiv. So for example, I'm spinning up an app one, yam, uh, app one component or a pod, and in which I've specified the following labels. I'm specifying which 
contiv tenant it needs to be part of. I'm specifying the network new net that I just created, and I'm also specifying that it needs to be part of the app group. So labels is a construct that is available in the Kubernetes platform itself. We are basically using that metadata to define and provide that as part of the application uh, deployment itself. So I'm doing that for app one, I'm doing that for app two, and, and I'm also doing that for my DB component. So now I can see I've got three pods that have been spun up. They've got IP addresses assigned here. This is from the subnet that I had created using Contiv. So in my next window here, I'm just going to um, get into my uh, app one container. I just went into there. If I do an IPA, uh, I can see that it's got 100 uh, uh, IP address uh, from that subnet range that, that has been defined. Uh, if I try to ping, uh, let's say, my 101 pod, which is basically my um, app 2, I'm not able to do that because I don't have the policies yet defined. Similarly, if I do that for, uh, oops, I got the IP address wrong. So let's, I should be able to ping this. Yes. So this is, I'm able to ping this because app two and app one are part of the same group. But if I'm trying to ping app my DB group, uh, the container in the DB group, I'm not able to do that because I've got that policy enforcement that says that, hey, you are only able to ping to components that are part within your own group. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to proceed here uh, and, and basically enable ICMP traffic for my app to DB uh, policy, and I'm saying now I want to enable traffic from my app container to my DB container. So if I go ahead and now ping uh, 102, I can just ping that now. So what you just saw is that as a developer, now I have the flexibility and the control to basically isolate different parts of my application into containers, provide connectivity to them uh, by default, by attaching them to networks that are getting created by, through Contiv. Uh, and then once they have been deployed, I can basically define groups and policies within those groups to define how exactly or what IPs can talk to each other. And you can take this another level in terms of exposing the exact ports uh, from these containers to the rest of the infrastructure or to the rest of the comp uh, containers as well. Um, so this is kind of you know leveraging both the DevOps mentality as well as integrating with the IT admin functionality. Uh, where, for example, you can attach your content networks to existing VLANs within your deployment. Uh, so it gives you the powerful combination of choosing different networking backends that works best for the IT administrator, and also gives you the flexibility to incorporate those metadata and labels uh, into your entire application workflow. Um, that was the demo. I'm not, uh, there's, uh, there's other things in the demo, but feel free to talk to me after the session, too, uh, and I can provide more data. Uh, but this is the final slide that I have in terms of uh, additional information. Uh, again, contev.io is our website. It's all open source. Uh, there's a bunch of tutorials available, uh, and there's a good amount of videos also from previous uh, 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 demos that we have done. Uh, all of our, uh, you know, we have a Slack community where our developers are active, where a lot of our customers and partners and other companies that are interested in contributing code to it are also participating. So highly encourage you to join into that. Um, and, and I also wanted to point out here uh, in DevNet Create, uh, at DevNet Create, we are launching here uh, the Cisco DevNet Sandbox for Contiv. Uh, that sandbox is also using the exact uh, demo that I just showed. So whatever I just showed you, actually, you can log on to that link that's there as part of that slide, and you can spin up a Kubernetes cluster with Contiv enabled with a VXLAN-based backend and create uh, containers and pods that attach on the same network and create policies and groups. So I highly encourage you to go and try that after this talk if, if this was interesting to you. Um, that's it for me. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Um, you showed their private network that was statically defined. How do you deal with uh, dynamically uh, allocated AP addresses, DHCP scopes? Correct. So the so question, just to repeat the question, is I define a static IP address in a subnet uh, as part of the network creation. How, how do I handle 
dynamic uh, uh, IP address assignment. The assumption, I guess, there is that when a container comes up, you have a DHCP server that's already existing in the data center, and you want to leverage that to assign IP addresses. So we don't have that capability today. In fact, most of the container orchestration platforms have built-in IPAM capabilities. I mean, if you even look at OpenStack, uh, they have an IPAM uh, capability built in. Uh, if you look at uh, Kubernetes or if you look at Docker Swarm, they have IPAM pluggable drivers to integrate with your infrastructure to provide IP addresses. Um, so most of the times, you're uh, relying on the developer to define that range or working with your IT admin to get that range. Uh, but of course, I can definitely see a use case where you have that data available within an external system, and you want to just use that as part of your entire deployment. That capability does not exist today, though. Sure. Any other questions? Cool. Thanks. Thank you, Rohit. Um, that was very interesting. Uh, I think the next talk we have is um, Akshay, uh, Akshay Mathur. He's traveled from India, and uh, he's going to talk and give some context on uh, cloud deployment security. So um, it's going to be an interesting talk. So Akshay, it's all yours. So for a change, I'm going to talk about a change. I'm not going to pitch a product. Uh, I need to be here. And let's take a step back and think why we are doing all this, why we build applications, for whom we are doing it. Right. So most important person in the whole ecosystem is not us. It's not the technology. Technology is not a person. That's not the ingredient. We are doing it all for our users. They are the important person. They consume the applications. So the users are changing. They are demanding more. They are looking for better experience. And that's why we are building applications and we are changing our applications. And then come us, the developers. So we also need to change. And that's what we are going to talk about. And that's why we are here. And the other component that is infrastructure, that is also changing like from data centers to now microservices, dockers, cloud, so many things. So that's what, that's what we are here, and that's what we are talking about. And that's, again, a change that we are talking about security here in the changing application trends. The business models are also changing. The DevOps practice is coming in, and so on. But are we only changing, or somebody else is also changing? Attackers are also changing. We have seen WannaCry. After so long, people figured out okay, some vulnerability and started attacking. And here's how I am changing. I started with a company called Mojo Networks in Wi-Fi security domain. Went to the social shopping domain in Zinrelo and now work with A10 Networks. So let's start. Uh, so one more thing that is changing, but in the in little wrong direction, and that we need to change is the perception. Perception about we as a developer. So there was a survey done by A10, and 50%, almost 50%, not exactly 50, the organizations think that their developers are not serious about security. We all know that's wrong, but that's the perception we are living into. And we need to change that. Not just we need to work for security, but we need to make sure that people understand we are working for security. So we make applications secure so that people can trust on us. 
So how many of us, by the way, here think that applications are secure in the cloud? Nobody thinks that way? Okay, at least one. So everybody else think that applications are more secure in the data centers, is that the case? Or we are becoming lazy here? Most of people, I think, like becoming lazy. Some, some hands here, okay. So let's see how the survey report, it's not done by Aiden, some other general survey company. And in this case, 60% of people actually say that they feel applications are secure in the cloud. Why this perception, that's a different thing. And 29 30% people are saying, no, they are, they are not. And 13% of people are still unsure, like, okay, I don't know. So let, let's, let's go here, whether it's cloud, like public clouds, or whether it's uh, the cloud's environment provided by our own team. But let's consider them same and then figure out how we, we can do it, how we can create a complete system so that ultimately the whole thing is secure and users are happy, their data is safe and everything. So let, let's, come, let's come to that and see when we consider that application is secure. So very simple three things. Whenever somebody wants to access the application, he should be able to. And only the person who is the legitimate user should be able to access. And the third simple thing is the data. That's all is required, nothing more than this. Right, Any, anybody differs? Okay. So now when, when we need to achieve this, now there are infrastructure, and code, two major parties. And let's see what the public cloud providers say in this area, how can we secure, whose responsibility is this? See, the Azure and AWS are like major biggest partners, and of course, Cisco is coming up with D-Cloud Orchestrator, and Google is coming up with cloud, or so many other health have the cloud. But clearly, it is mentioned that it's a shared responsibility. Some areas here, and in the case of AWS also, the some responsibility is cust when we, they say customer is we as developer who is AWS customer. They have the responsibility of security. So if we, if we carefully look into it, it is more like what layers, who, who manages what layers. So let's look into this as from the network stack point of view, from the technology coming back to the technology point of view. It's a very familiar stack, right? And why this is stack? Because the applications are deployed somewhere and users as well as attackers are accessing it using the network. And that's why network stack. So if we, ca if we are able to secure the complete stack, the access to all of this, then things are going to be secure. So the first, the physical layer is completely managed by cloud service providers or IT teams or infrastructure teams. And they, they need to take care of it, they, they, they do take care of it. In case of cloud, it's their sole job. I need to come to that. Next one is the networking. And again, the physical networking, like cables and everything, that is again cloud team or the infrastructure team. But now, networks are becoming virtual. And virtual networks again come to the developer or DevOps, the application team basically. They need to take care of it. And then the application. Then service providers or infrastructure providers, they don't understand it. They just provide the infrastructure and then we as a developer, we as application owners need to manage it, need to secure it completely. So it's completely our responsibility. They don't even talk about it. Let's take a little deep dive and then say why and how the infrastructure can be made secure. And this comes the various uh, certifications that these public cloud providers obtain. That's why they are secure and that's why maybe the perception is that, okay, cloud is secure. If we manage it, the infrastructure ourselves, the, our team also need to do the same. And then, the security part means just so many talks are happening on network security and everybody's thinking for so long the best practices of networking 
are so well induced into us that whenever we try to build a network, be it physical or virtual, we always go by that, okay, we have to have an IP firewall and we have to have an IPS and, and so on. So that, that's already, already there. Then the best practices of application security. Write good code, take good libraries and everything. And I say, yes, we all do that. But is, is that make us completely secure? No attack happens. And it's always about application, always about writing good code. Again, let, let's see the data once again. So malware injection that has to do something like some backdoor by which some software gets installed like WannaCry or something. No matter how secure we want to go, how patch apply and everything, something goes here and there. And then if we see like denial of service attacks, I mean, that has nothing to do with how good we do, we keep our application. People are going to attack. People are going to attack at network layer. People are going to attack at uh, application layer. Attacks are going to happen. And attacks are also changing. The attackers are trying to do as much as possible, multiple vectors, and which vector they find little weak, the attack happens from there. The other change that is happening is, earlier it used to be like, okay, we do the attack, figure out what's problem there, adapt the attack, and then go. Boom the service. Now what is happening is, this is everything together, oh, some place or the other, some vulnerability will be there, and as quickly as possible, we go ahead and attack the service. So we also need to build accordingly. And then we talked about some traffic portions, like bot, traffic from bots. So many people say, okay, that's not security problem. That's fine. They are not going to steal anything. They are, they are, our application is going to run fine. But about 30% of traffic now is from bots. So if we do not secure our application against bots, then 30% of our capacity is going, going waste. What is the whole point? The other thing, again, the, because we are building everything for users and they are becoming impatient, they don't wait for application page to load for long. So we need to respond faster. And that's another challenge that organizations are finding. And with the growth of this microservices architecture and cloud, the distributed networking, distributed uh, applications, so applications are deployed here and there. Now it is becoming challenging that, okay, you go in each, each and every instance and configure it and see what's happening there. So central management is becoming another challenge. So in this context, one company, one of our customers, I'm not, I can't take the name, but they came to us at ATA and said, okay, we have an application deployed in cloud. We have a load balancer or maybe we have a little higher than layer seven load balancer. Now we understand that we need to take care of security. So let's do something. Can you give us the security product? We said, fine, okay. Then what you will do for the visibility portion? So finally, this is how they thought of doing it. So okay, we'll put some security and then we will put some monitoring and then we'll put some acceleration and then traffic management that they already had. And on top of it, they want, finally, this like elastic infrastructure is required, so elasticity at each layer. So finally, this is how their architecture was, complicated. They need to put multiple layers, multiple products, and then stitch them together, get data from one, push it to other, and, and so on. What we provided is the simplest simplified architecture. They started with security, so they got security, plus simplified architecture, plus operational efficiency, and so on. So that's how, rather than fo focusing on individual technology and individual product, 
it is about how we can put them together and make it simple, not just for us, but also for our end customers. Ultimately, the goal is the users and the applications and their data that has to be good, secure. So let me, after this, let me introduce quickly about what the product does. We call it Lightning Application Delivery System. This is the data plane component. This is built on SDN architecture. The data plane component and management is separate. And the traffic goes via the data plane, of course, and management can reside outside. And actually, ATEN provides it as SaaS. And not just security, but it also gives the elasticity, the visibility, the traffic management, and all, all those things in as a single product. Coming back to the topic, that when when we surveyed, uh, not this agency surveyed the the companies, the, what they want to do. So top priority is they want to do application security monitoring and web application firewall. So that's like high level check mark. But what exactly happens? Like how we do it? What are the nitty gritties of it? Maybe we discuss it not today. Maybe we discuss it tomorrow in the, in the workshop session. For now, let's have it like three simple key takeaways. The infrastructure is taken, it should be taken care by the infrastructure team or cloud service providers and complete focus in there and build a robust infrastructure there. Networking, physical, they will take care of. And we as application owners need to take care of the virtual networking. And application security is our responsibility. And that's where users trust us. Actually, according to the survey, the 50, around 50% of the users think that the security should be taken care by developers or their IT teams. So they trust on us. They trust in our applications. So it's, it becomes our like moral duty to live up, up to that. And we need to make effort so that users are happy and tr keep trust our application, keep trust in us. So the whole thing can remain secure as much as we can. So we need to, we need to go ahead, we need to make sure that things remain secure and we are not giving away the keys to somebody else. Thank you. Anything? Thank you, Akshay. Uh, any questions? I, I, I think I agree with you, Akshay. I think the easiest vector is human beings, so it's much easier to compromise. <laughs> so yeah. So we are like we we again the way I started is go we go into technology and I didn't talk about any code or anything. I say oh what the hell, yeah. uh, that's okay. Yeah. It's it's about humans. It's about our responsibility. It, uh, yes. It's and it's important. about users and us. It's not about the technology and, and, and so on. Technology are just the means of doing, achieving that. Yeah. OK, okay. Thank, thank, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks for staying here. Yeah. I me. think uh, our uh, just continuing this session forward, um, I think uh, we have touched upon Snort, which we started as one of the infrastructure uh, piece. Uh, then we went to Conti, which was um, about containers. How do we secure them? How do we apply policies? I think Akshay touched upon a very important point is it's a shared responsibility. And I think to close, uh, we have a very good session which, uh, with uh, speaker Boris Chan, and he's going to touch upon on application security in DevOps environment. So Boris, it's all yours. Okay. 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 Sounds good.
Great. So everybody can hear me? Okay, awesome. Well, thanks for staying. Uh, this talks about uh, application security made DevOps. I'm, my name is Boris Chen. I work at a startup uh, called T-Cell. We're based here in the city. Uh, we do application security at runtime. Uh, but I'm not going to go into the product details. I'm going to talk uh, more generally about how security, uh, in particular apps, application security, plays into DevOps and how DevOps is essential for uh, strong application security. So um, why application security? Well, the first thing is that web app attacks are actually the top breach pattern. Uh, that's according to Verizon's uh, 2016 DBIR. And uh, every company now is uh, an IT company of some sort. Uh, it's a software eating the pro uh, software eating world concept. Uh, and so, as people know here, DevOps in particular has enabled uh, higher quality, faster innovation in applications. Before, we were always making the trade-off between uh, stability and innovation, and DevOps has helped, been a key factor in breaking that deadlock in order for us to accelerate how we innovate and how we deliver. Um, that everyone knows here. But one thing I want to point out is how DevOps uh, plays with application security. This is a developing trend. Some people might have heard of uh, DevSecOps or SecDevOps, one or the other. Um, but uh, that's what I'm going to dive into. Uh, so the key thing here is that, uh, to start off is security starts at the beginning. A lot of times people think of, OK, well, I'll just develop my thing, and then I'll buy something and make it secure. Well, that, that never works, as anyone who's tried it um, has uh, experienced. And so let's sort of take a, our step, step back just a little bit about uh, DevOps uh, three principles. A lot of people have seen this. This is uh, from, from uh, Gene Kim's uh, DevOps handbook, uh, but there's other things that this diagram has uh, come out in. But uh, the three principles are basically flow, you know, how you go from beginning to end. How do you automate that? How do you uh, make that as fast as possible? The feedback, the fast iterations, right? Everything should be highly iterative. And then the continuous learning. At every stage, with integrated teams, integrated process, integrated tools, you can, uh, your teams learn, have a shared responsibility, and it accelerates the innovation the, the op in operations, but also, in this context, security. So why is uh, the first concept so key? So it's really important to get from beginning to end as soon as possible. And in order to do that, uh, again, you have to start at the beginning uh, with security. So security from the ground up. Is, is the team integrated into the design process? Are these security engineers part of the design, the architecture? Uh, are they part of the scrum? Uh, do they use the same tool sets? Oftentimes I see people, you know, we have our security issues here, we have our dev issues there. You'll never be able to uh, communicate uh, effectively uh, with that setup. And, and that's how you, you, you distribute that shared responsibility across the team. Uh, are, your, are your things automated? If you do code analysis, are they automated just like you do um, your automated tests? Uh, do you uh, incorporate security into your code reviews? But most importantly, the reason why you want to finish fast is what happens when you deploy. When you deploy is when you actually see uh, your product in action. You get the user feedback. You get to see how it, how it functions under real load. In the same way, you get to see how your security assumptions, designs, uh, all hold up in the real world environment. Uh, so I'm going to uh, illustrate this a little bit, why this is the case uh, in the DevOps model and why DevOps helps uh, accelerate an order of magnitude over traditional waterfall. And this is something that LP, many of you may have seen before if you've been to uh, lots of DevOps talks. But I'll just review this quickly, just for those who haven't seen it. But there's an illustration of mailing letters. So you have four stages of mailing letters. You have uh, folding the paper, you have putting it in the envelopes, you have sealing the envelopes, and you have stamping the envelopes. So the question is, do you do each thing as a batch? Do you fold all the paper, take all the paper, then fold, put them in all the envelopes, et cetera? Uh, that, uh, or do you do, you do uh, uh, many batches of one. So you take one sheet of paper, put that in a vote, seal it, and stamp it, and then repeat. Right? So the questions put forth, you know, which one is the most efficient? The in, sort of instinctive, at least for me, is like the big batch seems like it's most efficient, because you can sort of assembly line it. 
Um, but uh, in reality, you come up with some problems. Uh, and this is an an analogous to the waterfall versus uh, um, uh, agile approaches. And the reason uh, can be sort of seen by this chart. So at the top, you have the big batch, where you fold, say, four pieces of paper, uh, one, two, three, four. Then you uh, seal, then you uh, stamp, or well, you, you seal and stamp. So the first time you get the first available batch to see a complete product, a complete thing ready to mail, is way at the end, the first available, after you've gone through that process. Whereas in a small batch, the first time you see it is after the first four steps. And so you have a delay in the first product available. Why is this so important? Well, think about what happens if your paper uh, doesn't fit correctly, right? You only figure that out at the last thing. And then you have to redo the batches ahead of time, and that, uh, or the batches that you've already done, right? You basically have to toss out the material. And this happens in, in software engineering projects all the time, where you do late integration, and then you realize, oh, an assumption that we did during design didn't hold true, and so we have to sort of rework something. And so the fast uh, process to first available is what uh, de-risks that. Well, the same concept happens with security, is that, um, that getting to the first available is the first time you actually see things in production, and you get to see all the things that happened prior to that uh, live. And so um, let's review a little bit about why, um, why, this is, uh, uh, why this is the case of the first batch or the small batch helps, is that uh, you have a high amount of work in progress with the large batches. You have a high cost of mistakes uh, with large batches. Uh, and then you don't have the iterative improvement, which is key for the product. And then in the end, you sort of think, I thought, well, you might have all those things, but what about the end result, the time to beginning the end? That surely is shorter with the big batches, because batching in general seems to, to help with that. But they've actually shown, had studies shown that actually small batches uh, end up being faster on the whole, which is very interesting, but also explainable if you think about uh, the, 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 the muscle memory that you do in order to do the fold, all, all the steps in the process. And that's what you want to do with security. You want to have that integrated in the whole thing, not at the end, because if you don't, if you, if you don't have that fast path, right, um, you're, you're going to uh, uh, have to revisit a lot of assumptions that you had prior. And so the key thing is that you want to get to real data as soon as possible. Uh, the sooner you get uh, something live is the sooner that you can ver verify uh, what you've assumed. And uh, that's when you get security for real, right? Everything's uh, before that is theoretical. Oh, you did a pen test. OK, great. Uh, you did a, a code review. OK, that's great. Uh, you know, uh, those things are all good things to do. But until something's live, then uh, then you don't have the actual data. Uh, and so I want to introduce uh, security starting at the end. So I just talked about you need security from the beginning, but actually uh, you also need it at the end. And what do I mean by that is the feedback loop. Because when you get to the end, what do you do with that? Well, you want to take that information that you've learned and then fold that into the beginning part. And having those fast iterations is, ha is how DevOps is successful, and that, that's the same case uh, with security. Um, when you have uh, data, live data um, in production, you can look at what attackers are doing on your site. Not only attackers, but also real users, but uh, primarily, since this is a security talk, talking about attackers. When, we, when you have those attack patterns, uh, that helps you, informs how you prioritize your work, right? Because we always have this uh, issue of having many things to do, uh, little time to do it. And so the key things for that is priorities. And, how you, how you want to drive priorities is not through uh, theoretical things. You want to do it by hard data. It allows you to uh, re-inspect your assumptions about how things are to perform in production. And also, more importantly, is that it shows any oversights that you've had. Because you will have oversights, right? You might use the right frameworks. You might have the right process. You might have the right tools. But something falls uh, between the cracks. and and uh, having that visibility in production helps that. And then that can fold back into the beginning, and that, uh, that provides that very fast cycle time. And why do you want to have that fast cycle time is, um, is basically that uh, whenever you have the remediation, 
uh, you can address those uh, very quickly. And, uh, and that also plays into how attackers attack the pro the pro the, your system as well, right? So uh, what I mean by that is that when you have fast iterations, uh, your, the target that the attackers are going against is actually always moving. So if you imagine that you deploy every six months, then you have a very static target for those six months. The recon that they did five months ago on your site still applies uh, the next month, the, next, the month after, and the month after that. So the shelf life of that information is very long standing. When you get your deployment down to one month, then the shelf life is one month, and then down to one week, one day, one hour, right? So the more that you have this faster feedback, is the, 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 the more dynamic your, your, your target is, and that, makes it, that increases the, the attack um, cost of the attacker. And that's one of the key things that you always want to do is for anything that you have is increasing the, the, t uh, the, the cost uh, for attacking. And then the final thing I want to cover is continuous learning. So I talked about this a little bit, but um, when you have the real-time data in production, you can use that for every stage of the process, whether it's uh, development, testing, et cetera. Um, that helps you basically develop the DevOps culture of security being everybody's job, the shared responsibility that comes with that. As a security person, you have the same, uh, security people have the same dilemma that ops people have, right? That there's many more developers than ops people, there's many more uh, 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 developers than security people. And so having security uh, um, uh, being a shared responsibility allows the, company, the, the team to scale, but in order to scale, you need that data, and, uh, and, the, and having that common uh, pane of glass allows you to have those uh, uh, teachable moments that informs every stage of the process. It helps you evaluate your designs, helps evaluate the tool chain that you've chosen, uh, it evaluates your process, it informs your code reviews, and also informs your postmortems. We're a very, uh, 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 it's a very common practice to have ops and dev in postmortems, and security is, is a key component of that. Um, so this, uh, I put together this checklist as a as a, as a quick overview of things that you are essential if you want a, uh, a, a good application security uh, program for, for DevOps. Um, there's, a cat there's several categories of tools that you want. So one is static analysis. Oftentimes people use this to find bugs, but there's also uh, lots of use cases that you find things via static analysis for, for, uh, for, te for security. Uh, dynamic analysis, uh, there's things uh, like uh, OWASP's uh, Zap tool. Um, there's other uh, things like Burp, et cetera. Those provide uh, dynamic analysis. There's a, a dependency scanning. What are the things you, you are incorporating into your applications that could provide or could introduce risks that maybe you don't happen to see in testing, but there's a known vulnerability from this package you're using. You better know that ahead of time before you build everything around it. Um, source code integrity and code signing. So oftentimes you say, okay, I have everything in Git and I just deployed it, but what happens if, how do you know that what you've actually deployed, oops, sorry, is um, what you're actually, or what you've actually developed is what you actually deployed, right? So uh, source code integrity and signing help prevent uh, that type of tampering that can introduce backdoors. Uh, developer training and standards, again, if it's a shared uh, process, a shared responsibility, you want, and you want it from the beginning, then, then everybody has to be brought into the fold. Uh, you might want to have cloud security. Everyone moves to the cloud. It's the same thing as host and network security. Uh, you want uh, that to, as well. But the key thing I want to also uh, bring out, as you see in each of the slides I showed, is a key component for application security is the runtime security monitoring and also protection uh, of your application. Uh, why is that? Well, as I mentioned before, is that you can go through the whole dev process and say, I've used the right frameworks for for, uh, let's, let's take the example of performance. I use the right uh, uh, scalable infrastructure uh, uh, tools to, to develop my application. I have uh, you know, auto-scaling groups, I have good, powerful machines to handle a load, and it went through performance testing. If you have all those things, do you need to do monitoring and production? Right? No one ever says, oh, you've done all those things? The ops person says, oh, sure, then I don't need to use Datadog or New Relic or anything to monitor my life site, right? No one ever says that. So 
it's funny how uh, we forget that for security. Uh, when, we f when we first started T-Cell, the interesting thing about it is that it was surprising the number of people we talked to that says, well, we already have uh, strong uh, uh, secure frameworks that we use. We already do static checking. We already do tests and quarterly pen tests. So there's no reason to have a security tool in production. Um, that, that, that I thought, uh, thought was quite stunning. Uh, but the real reality is you, you do need, because the things do fall through the cracks. Uh, you want to uh, uh, account for that, because if you, if, you, if, if you count on things not falling through the cracks, it's, it's basically Murphy's Law. And the, th the other thing that you want to do is make sure that it's real time. Uh, just like you want to know as soon as possible when something is broken in your site, you want to know when an attack is successful uh, on your site as soon as possible as well. Um, you know that uh, uh, things will fall through the cracks, as I mentioned. And the last thing is uh, to keep in mind is virtual patching. So when things fall through the cracks, when things are discovered and exploited by somebody, even if you have a fast cycle time, right, even if you, you, can, you can test within five minutes and everything like that, someone has to still fix it. Uh, right, so that, that lag time still makes your live site exposed because you can't just shut down your site um, while, while there's a vulnerability existing. So virtual patching is a way in order to block attacks at runtime, which a lot of vendors, uh, including T-Cell, provide. And that gives you basically air cover while your dev team is able to remediate, and then your ops team can push out a patch, uh, whether it's uh, you know, uh, an hour or, or a day, you still need that time uh, while, that, while that vulnerability is available. So uh, in conclusion, uh, I covered the three areas um, of the three principles of uh, DevOps, the flow, feedback, and learning, and how security is, um, can be integrated in each of those concepts. And, but the key takeaway here is to know that in order for this all to be successful, you want to get to the end. Right? You want to get live data at the end, and once you have that data at the end, that informs every stage of the process in which you can iterate uh, for faster deployments, and also you can level up the team by continuous learning where you can use that data to, to, uh, to improve the security posture every step of the way. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Any questions?